Welcome to Surgeon's Log 2020, Case Archives of the Skull Base and Beyond, a webinar presented by the North American Skull Base Society in association with Global Brain Surgery Initiative. I'm your host, Dr. Walter Jean of George Washington University. If you've enjoyed this and other episodes, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. For now, put on your learning hats and enjoy this episode of Surgeon's Log 2020. Welcome to the 11th episode of Surgeon's Log 2020. We are now up to uh, double digits now in our series, and uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, for the, our European and African friends, a good afternoon, and thank you for joining us as well. The presenting team will be a team from University of Cincinnati, uh, where I uh, also did some of my training. Uh, Norberto Andalus is professor of neurosurgery, um, and uh, Ravi Sami is professor of otolaryngology at the University of Cincinnati, and they will be presenting uh, to, uh, to us today. Our special guest in discussion is uh, needs no introduction. Dr. Rick Freeman is probably the only uh, skull base surgeon that has a fan club on Facebook. Uh, I discovered this quite, quite by accident that there is a there is a fan of Dr. Freeman club on Facebook. Uh, very jealous. Very. That's very a great jealous. story. I can tell you one day. <laughs> and uh, like, can I join the Facebook group for you? Can I? Uh, <laughs> Groupy. And so, Doc. Dr. Freeman will be finishing our uh, discussion today as a discussant, and we may have actually a surprise cameo by another uh, uh, physician as well. And on the hot seat is Dr. Yin Ren, uh, who is a fellow for, uh, for Dr. Friedman uh, and is currently the otology fellow at the University of California, San Diego. So Good without further ado, uh, we, our episode is called Blue Jean Baby, LA Lady. And, and now apparently <laughs> these titles are all kind of getting uh, talked about on, on the uh, internet and social media. This of course is the first line of uh, Tiny Dancer. Yes. Uh, and uh, if you know uh, Elton John, Sir Elton John. Uh, so what is the Tiny Dancer doing? Let's go find out. Dr. Ren, we have a 46-year-old uh, man who's otherwise healthy with a six-month history of right-sided tinnitus, asymmetric hearing loss, and imbalance. So the right side seems to be uh, the side of interest. Uh, personal and family history are non-contributory. Uh, on examination, you found that positive Rene bilaterally, Weber was lateralizing to the right, and nystagmus also to the right. Uh, for our younger trainee audience, uh, can you tell us uh, what uh, they should take away from this exam? Um, well, so first, he's a 46-year-old he's a man with uh, six months of sort of a subacute history of right-sided hearing loss. Um, and uh, based on the and, and, uh, onset of tinnitus, uh, so unilateral hearing loss and tinnitus, and um, what's his, um, and some imbalance symptoms, what's his uh, logic exam like? Um, his eardrums normal, okay. Otherwise, Ren. Normal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so based on this, uh, we're thinking about various etiologies that could cause um, uh, hearing loss. Uh, you know, just very broadly, they could be conductive versus sensor neural. Um, so there are different etiologies for those. Um, the uh, 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 fork test can tell us a little bit about what the um, uh, um, etiology of that would be the the Weber lateralizes to the, the side of the hearing loss so he could have uh, either a conductive loss on the right or a sensor neural loss on the left. Um, Rene is positive bilaterally and uh, he has some nystagmus which suggests that there may be um, uh, a vestibular component to this as well. Okay all right what are you thinking about this? Yeah, so here, so uh, that's what I would do. The next thing was I would do an audiogram, an uh, audiogram um, which, you know, shows the amount of um, hearing loss as well as uh, word discrimination scores. So here we have um, his right, his, his left side has pretty much normal uh, bone conduction and air conduction um, across the, the, all the frequencies. However, there's asymmetric uh, downsloping from uh, pretty much normal to uh, moderate to uh, uh, severe uh, sensor neural hearing loss 
uh, on the right with slight uh, decrease in SRT, but otherwise his um, word discrimination is still excellent. Um, uh, they did not test, uh, it looks like they didn't test any uh, uh, tympanometry or reflex testing. All right, so with that, uh, what do you want to do? Um, so given the asymmetry, given the onset, um, next I would uh, consider some more diagnostic um, utilities, including an, an imaging, an MRI scan. All right, let's scroll through and I will stop. Right, okay, mm -hmm. and let's look at this guy right there. Oh, this mm -hmm. one is hard to stop. Uh, okay, so what uh, what do you see there? Can you let the mm -hmm. audience know what your thoughts are? Yeah, so this is two uh, sections on the left is a axial uh, uh, with contrast uh, T1 uh, weighted uh, MRI and uh, uh, on the right is a chrono of the of the same sequence. Um, on the left, what you can on the left side of the screen, what you can see is uh, there's an enhancing abnormality uh, it looks like located in the cerebellar pontine angle that uh, extends into uh, what looks like the internal auditory canal. It is enhancing. Um, it's uh, relatively homogeneous, and then on the contralateral side, the ISC looks uh, uh, normal. There's no enhancing lesions. Um, the ISC does look a little widened as well. So, and what then, kind of what kind of other sequence would you want to pay attention to on the mm -hmm. same study? Um, I would want to look at the heavily T2 weighted uh, Kiss or Fiesta sequence. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> and I'll stop where you tell me. Okay, I'm going to go. Oh. That's I was bit. trying to go slow there, but it, it went away. Let's see whether it will stop for me now. It's pretty good there. Okay. Um, Your thoughts? Yeah, so, so here is a T2 weighted, heavily T2 weighted um, kiss or, or fiesta sequence, which it nicely shows the uh, where fluid CSF is bright. Um, so in on the uh, contralateral side on the left side where uh, the CSF would fill the uh, internal auditory canal going all the way out to, you can see the cochlea lighting up, you can see the part of the labyrinth, uh, the posterior canal. Um, and uh, you can actually see the cochlear vestibular nerve and the facial nerve fibers going uh, from the brainstem to the uh, fundus. Uh, on the right side, uh, there is a space occupying lesion. Again, as you can see, the CSF fluid is displaced. Uh, there is um, uh, what looks like, as we saw on the T1 sequences, this um, uh, space occupying lesion in the ISC that uh, extends a little bit out of the um, bony internal auditory canal into the, uh, into the extra meatus space. Um, you okay. can see the, the, the nerve uh, spatial and uh, cochlear vestibular nerves coming out of the brainstem there. All right, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this, but let, let's start with what do you think this is? Uh, what do you think this is first? I think um, given his symptoms and uh, given his, his audiogram findings uh, and the imaging, the most likely uh, diagnosis for this would be uh, a vestibular schwannoma in, in the IAC, is extending a little bit out into the CP angle. And, and is uh, there, there any other... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, there are other uh, diagnoses, which include a schwannoma of the other cranial nerves of the facial nerve, for example, uh, cochlear schwannoma um, or facial nerve schwannoma in addition to a vestibular schwannoma. Um, it does not have the typical uh, appearance of a, a meningioma per se. It doesn't have the uh, dural tail and the, the shape of the IAC, but uh, it is also a, meningiomas could occur in this space, so that's also a possibility. To but vestibular schwannoma is really, you know, m I, most likely, right? You, you, you said that already. Now, so what, is there any kind of diagnostic assessment tool that you still want to do, uh, or is, is, did we pretty much cover it? Um, I think that it's, it's um, we have pretty much covered it. I mean, you could do, uh, although that's not something we do commonly, as, as far as I, I know, you could do some further auditory testing like an ABR. Uh, but I think with the audiogram and the MRI, it's, it's, uh, you can get 
the information you need from all right so you know this is a person seeing you and you and and he very wide open to to your opinion is that mm -hmm. so treat or not to treat um it's a good question i think that depends on several factors um obviously uh, i would tell him that you know this is most likely a benign a disease that it's uh, slow growing that is a benign growth on the hearing and balance nerves so i would counsel him on sort of the the natural history uh since we don't since we're meeting him in the first time we don't know how this tumor has behaved how long it's been there and whether it's growing uh and, and other than the hearing symptoms if there are any other symptoms that he's experienced if so for how long so i would uh you know discuss with him sort of what we know about the um, natural history of this and depending, depending on, um, and, and I would like to get a little more data in terms of, you know, if we can um, figure out if, if the rate of growth or the, the, the duration of, of his symptoms and um, uh, that will kind of tell us uh, whether, you know, various treatments would be indicated. So again, this guy is wide open to whatever uh -huh. you, you, you want to say, mm -hmm. uh, wide open to consideration of all options. Do you have a personal lean on to which op which treatment you would you would not push but kind of recommend? Yeah. Um, so um, I would I would tell him you know with 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 uh, his uh, young age is forty six. Uh, his uh, good health. I think he's certainly and and um, it's a small tumor uh, with good hearing. Um, so I think all three options, which is observation, radiation, and uh, surgery, are are available to him. And um, I would uh, tell him, you know, we should at least see if if uh, the tumor has grown. Um, so let's just say hypothetically, I um, in six months, the tumor, if the tumor has grown significantly by you know, a couple of millimeters in the IAC, then that would bias me towards treatment. If in six so months, it sounds like your so, so it I sounds like your first uh, first recommendation is observation for six months. Yes, if I'm meeting him for the first time, um, then I would I would uh, it suggest that we can perhaps watch this for six months and see how he behaves. He might have strong feelings, you know, of saying, uh, "Get this, treat this." I don't I don't want to wait, and then that's another discussion. But that would be the first thing I would offer to him. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let's say that he's pushing you towards it. Just for the argument's sake, he's pushing sure. you towards it. What what particular <clears throat> attention are you going to pay on these on these on these imaging studies that would guide you towards one treatment versus another? Is there anything that you would want to pay particular attention to? Maybe not on these particular slices. Um, on uh, I would pay attention to obviously the the size and the configuration of the tumor, um, how much it extends uh, both laterally in the IAC and medially towards uh, the brainstem. Um, I would try to see where, you know, whether this is an inferior or superior vestibular nerve origin, but sometimes that's hard to, to tell exactly on the scan. Um, but I think certainly tumor size is a factor and how much it extends out into the um, into the, uh, if it touches the brainstem and immediately is a, is a factor. And that would uh, essentially, you know, um, uh, basically if, if he's, he's in, if the patient insists on treatment, um, you know, the, the two options that we have currently are uh, radiation, stereotactic radiosurgery versus uh, uh, surgical, microsurgical resection. I think given his young age, um, and, uh, you know, his long, uh, you know, he has probably several more decades of life expectancy. Um, he's, a, he's otherwise in good health and he has uh, really good hearing. Um, I think I would uh, lean more towards uh, not offering radiation just because, um, you know, it's, it's, he's got one more decades to live. The long-term effects, uh, even though he has good tumor control, um, you know, within sort of five, 10 years, uh, that uh, sort of the study knows, but we don't really know exactly, you know, what happens 20 or 30 years down the road, which he could very much still be, you know, alive and well. And the so, other for longe so for longevity of efficacy, you would, you would then side with the surgical side. Now, yeah. the, the vast majority of our audience, uh, even in, on YouTube and whatnot, neurosurgical. Mm -hmm. So please, 
educate us. Now we 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 know what to look for immediately. A person uh -huh. with brain not getting immune system. That's our you know uh -huh. daily way. What about laterally? What 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 laterally do you evaluate as an otologist mm -hmm. that that guides you towards one approach versus another? What's too lateral? What's not too lateral? Well, um, laterally, I will look at how far it goes and whether how far into the fundus, if it reaches the fundus, if there is fluid in the fundus. Um, also, I will look on the T2 flare to see um, what the flare signal is in the cochlea. And uh, uh, because um, sometimes we see if there's an increased flare signal, it, it, it suggests to us at least maybe the tumor is doing something that increases, you know, the, the amount of the total protein content in the cochlea. And we've seen cases where that could make, uh, make it, you know, more challenging to preserve hearing, of course, which is the goal in this uh, case for surgery is to remove tumor completely and hopefully preserve hearing and uh, protect, you know, the facial nerve. And what about the fundus? How does uh -huh. that influence your choice or your recommendation or your guidance towards the patient? Um, if there is a fundal fluid cap, which I looked at, it looks like there is, I think that uh, helps uh, in terms of uh, removing the tumor completely from the fundus, uh, getting a better outcome and, uh, uh, you know, better functional outcome, neurological outcome overall. So that, 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 that influences your prognostication towards the patient, right? Yes, overall. I think there are uh, reports actually, you know, there, there have been reports previously, literature saying, having a fundal fluid cap is uh, a, a good prognosticator for hearing preservation, uh, especially for uh, middle fossa surgery. Um, but there are also has been reports saying that it's, it's not an important prognosticator, but in those studies, they found that um, it's actually having, uh, it's not rather, rather having a fundal cap or not, it's that the tumors that have fundal caps are smaller and maybe they thought it was actually tumor size rather than the absolute, you know, relative location of the tumor, whether it's middle of the IAC, lateral in the IAC, or more medial. Uh, but in general, I think there's a uh, inclination that if there is a fundal cap, then, then it's a better chance of saving that. <clears throat> All right. So again, for argument's sake, this guy is pushing towards some sort of treatment because he's just a nervous willy. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is the goal of treatment? You said one of them is some, is hearing preservation, right? You said that already. Yeah. I'm not putting words in your mouth. What, what other goal treatment? Uh, I think the, the goals would be um, uh, for, for a young guy, we don't want to, you know, uh, leave any tumor behind. Uh, so uh, removal of gross total removal of tumor. Um, and uh, number two, be um, uh, functional neurological preservation of facial function and, uh, and also hearing preservation would be the third goal. And how are you going to advise him on all the alternatives mm -hmm. and what are the risk benefits to your recommendation? Um, sure. So alternatives would certainly be a reasonable alternative would be uh, observation. But uh, uh, I guess if, if he's, you know, inclined on going to the surgery, I would still discuss the various, you know, risks and benefits of observation. Um, you know, I would tell him that uh, vast majority of these cases, uh, it's likely a sporadic case, not an NF2 case, um, given that it's unilateral and these occurred much later in life. It's usually slow growing at a rate of uh, one to two millimeters a year. Um, so it's, it's, um, it, it grows slowly. Um, and the natural history based on what we know is that uh, if we don't do anything, uh, it will probably, you know, uh, grow slowly over the next five, 10 years, but sometimes they do grow a little faster. But the, the, the thing that almost invariably happens is the, the hearing would uh, ultimately decline um, if we don't do anything. Um, and uh, um, if, if we do do uh, uh, radiation, I think we, I've, I've touched on a little bit about uh, sort of the risks and benefits in terms of long-term tumor control and hearing loss that in radiation that uh, also, people have, have looked at that over, you know, 10, 15 years and found that hearing ultimately declines, even in patients who had uh, hearing preserved after radiation, that after, you know, five to 10 years, uh, maybe 50 to two thirds of the patients ultimately, their hearing uh, declines to non-serviceable. Um, so uh, in terms of surgery, the um, I would discuss with him the, uh, the in general, the three approaches, uh, uh, the middle fossa, the retrosigma, and the trans lab. 
uh, we're, we're going to get to we're going to get to uh, which approach you're going to choose in, the, in a second. Yeah. But but in in general, mm -hmm. with I, I guess it's hard to segregate from what your choice of approach is. What would you tell him for your rates in your hands, hearing <laughs> preservation rate and facial nerve preservation rate? Okay. Uh, in my hands, which would be from from our uh, my fellowship experience in San Diego, are uh, I would say for his type of tumor with you know, a perfect word recognition score and a relatively mild amount of hearing loss. I would say he has a, and then based on the configuration of the tumor that it does not extend all the way laterally into the fundus. There's a fluid cavity as well as a small tumor. I'd say he has a, a good rate of, of hearing preservation in the range of 60, maybe 65%. Okay. Um, I think with facial nerve, uh, uh, the risk of a permanent injury to the facial nerve causing a complete facial paralysis is, I would say it's it's 1%, maybe around there. Um, there's a, a risk of temporary weakness, uh, which is, uh, again, I would advise him that it's transient, that it will almost always recover to uh, symmetric. Uh, maybe it's on the order of um, five uh, percent or so. okay fair enough but, but you know my, my point is that it's important to have those numbers starting to brew in your head because you in the blink of an eye it's going to be june july and you're going to be on your own and you're going to be have a patient in, within a week or two in in your new life coming in and asking you those questions so you know it's it's good for uh, uh senior trainees to have those ready even though you you haven't done a thousand you don't have exactly your own series uh and, and whatnot to have some numbers available so mm -hmm. the big the big uh 20 million dollar question uh, what approach are you going to choose yeah um so I, I i briefly touch on the three i certainly would not uh do a trans labyrinthine if we're attempting hearing preservation i think okay. he's a good candidate for so with, with regard to the other two approaches, uh, with retrosigmoid, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a possible approach. There's ways to get uh, laterally, but I think the view uh, with the retrosigmoid, uh, especially for a, a more laterally based tumor can be limited, especially in the lateral uh, third of the, of the IAC uh, near the fundus. Uh, I think some uh, with, um, uh, so my, my preference for this tumor in this patient uh, with this good hearing, I would uh, uh, offer him the middle cranial fossa. Approach. Middle cranial fossa. Okay. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, Dr. Uh, Andalus and, and Sammy are going to talk in, extensively about their approach and, and whatnot. Just uh, skipping a, a couple of steps forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the big question that we always have to otologists is what is your way of finding the IAC mm -hmm. on the middle fossa floor? So mm -hmm. here, here's your spinosum, here's your GSPN. So what is your way of taking us to the, the Holy Grail? Here's the so, middle fossa uh, floor again in, uh, in the uh, virtual reality space. Here's the deep structures of the cochlea, I mean the labyrinth, the cochlea, and uh, the nerves. Um, oopsie. All right, so tell me your way of finding the IAC. My mm -hmm. way of finding is I would um, uh, first identify the arcuate eminence, uh, and then on the previous uh, slide, it was already identified, and then I would identify the GSPN, and then I would uh, find the angle between the two and bisect that angle, um, and I would start, uh, once I retract the temporal lobe medially, I would start as medial as I can uh, along the Peters Ridge uh, with, you know, the retractor protecting the temporal lobe and uh, I would elevate the superior patrillal sinus. So I would drill as medial as possible in the uh, in the bone that uh, in the area that bisects uh, basically the arc. Okay, so the so you're you're an angle bisector. You don't believe yeah. in that sixty degree measurement thing. Um, I, I I've I've the, the cases I've done. I've uh, always done bisecting, taking uh, drilling medially, and then being able to see Excellent. where the bone of the IC is. Why so. why medial? Why why not lateral? Um, it, it gets very tight uh, laterally in terms of uh, the critical structures between the cochlea um, and the, the IAC and the facial nerve. So there's a lot more room uh, medially uh, that is safer. And then it's once you've identified uh, where the, the, uh, the, the IAC is medially, then you can follow that, follow that out laterally. <clears throat> All right. Fantastic job. Uh, you've I think did an amazing job trying to verbalizing what I believe the audience must be thinking uh, and uh, uh, excellent work. 
So right. now, now that we've done the hypothetical, uh, we're going to get be, be, we're going to be told uh, by the presenting team what actually transpired. So I'm going to run their slides for them. And uh, Norberto and Ravi, uh, go ahead. Well, Please. thanks, Walter. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to congratulate you. You've done a wonderful job, and obviously you are learning from, you know, the best the best of the trade there. But yeah. uh, I, I want to stress that probably with this patience, you spend more time discussing what you're going to do, what the plan will be, than the time you spend doing the treatment itself. <laughs> uh, these are patients that uh, tend to, you know, since this is not a malignant condition, they come very educated to you. And I, I mm -hmm. still, I, you know, Walter may remember this from his time in Cincinnati. I still cannot forget the time when a patient walked into John Tew's room with a stack of papers like this, <laughs> exactly what, what kind of approach he wanted for his acoustic aroma because he was planning on keeping his audition, his hearing. So uh, it is extremely important and, uh, and, and the, for the procedure itself, and I think it, it's, it's wonderful to have champions like Dr. Schwartz and, 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 and Dr. Friedman um, to, to push for the approach and try to perfect it and give uh, good results because the approach has a serious problem. The, the, the problem is called radio surgery, osteodactic radio surgery. Uh, radiotherapy has, has raised the bar in terms of results very high. So these are procedures where everything has to be perfect. Um, and, uh, you know, many times, I mean, I always joke with, with, with Ravi, I, I sometimes a little bit more anxious about doing one of these uh, procedures than for clipping a basilar aneurysm because there's so much that goes with it. And, and, and you will hear later from Dr. Friedman that this, this, this really the results are in, in, in the details. So uh, Rin did a great job at discussing what are the treatment options. The number one treatment option probably is observation. Uh, that's what most patients will choose. But do you treat or do you not treat? And if you treat, what treatment are you going to give? And, and what do you consider in your treatment selection? Um, well, you spoiled our surprise about the fundal cap. Um, <laughs> So this is, this is something that, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, uh, looking at the authors there, this is something that for years I have myself uh, learning from, you know, from, from my, my mentors, Dr. Zuccarello, Dr. Van Loveren, and Dr. Tew. For years, I, you know, we looked into this as, as a, sometimes a, a prohibitive uh, a factor into considering middle fossa for hearing preservation. We, we knew that if you know, the, the, there was no fundal cap, your chances of preserving hearing were close to nil. And, um, and I think that you know, this is for working with, 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 with experienced autologists and, 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 and good autologists like we have had the luxury here through, through the years, uh, helps you look at things a little bit beyond just the procedure itself um, and, and, and the immediate outcome itself. And, and so the argument that, and I'll let you comment on this, Ravi, yeah. Uh, the, the argument is, uh, what, what about uh, pushing for somebody who does have, if, if patient obviously decides to go for surgery, uh, on, 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 on ignoring the issue of the fundal cap, and you see the counter argument there uh, from Dr. Gans' group, um, and, and leaving the, ana the nerve anatomically preserved, healthy, and, and, and think about some uh, restoration or augment augmentative procedure. And, and so that's the concept that that really has modified a little yeah. bit how we do things. So yeah, I agree. So if you look at Rick's paper, it's been a while since I've read that one. Um, I think technically we all do find it easier when there's a fundal clap cap. So Walter, you brought up the issue with Yin of, hey, tell me about the fundus. And when you go out laterally, it is a challenge. And when you first go out Yin and you know, you're working with stellar surgeons with Mark and Rick, but when you go out, it's you, right? Your name is there. You have not built the credibility of a Dr. Friedman or Dr. Schwartz. So getting to that level, you kind of cherry pick your tumors at the get-go. Yeah. Um, but what I also think the converse thing to that is, do we push the envelope? Absolutely. As you get more skilled at a middle fossa, for example, and I have patients where there is tumor in the fundus, um, I work really hard at trying to save the hearing while getting the exposure and it doesn't stop me. And so I train with Bruce Gans, who's a masterful uh, middle fossa surgeon. And I go all the way out into the fundus. 
and it's a little bit more hard to work there, and you're a little more concerned about that evulsing uh, cochlear nerve, losing the blood supply, but you have to get the exposure that you need. And so there's a converse argument to all this, which is if I don't do a middle fossa approach, and by the way, if you're doing a lot of middle fossa approaches, our assumption is all these patients for these size tumors should have grade one or grade two function in the end, right? That we don't want to sacrifice, try to save hearing, and yet you give them a grade three, four outcome or worse. Um, but the alternative for these approaches is if you're heading towards surgery, I know we'll talk about radio surgery later, then I either do a translab approach, which is 100% chance of deafness, or a retrosigmoid approach where I leave tumor behind as well. Um, so I still push the envelope on these, and uh, we've now done middle fossas here for 15 years plus, and I will still try, try this approach even if there's a lot of tumor in the fungus. Robbie, I didn't realize that you were that old. <laughs> well, <laughs> and by the way, there is another Cincinnati connection. I owe a lot to Rick. Rick was here right before I was. I had big shoes to fill. And, uh, you know, Rick and I are blessed to have been trained by some amazing surgeons, he by Gerald Brackman and me by Bruce Gantz. And you get uh, really uh, infatuated with the middle foster approach with those guys. So let's let's move forward here. Uh, you you talked about the the preservation and, and also the preservation of facial nerve in doing that. So uh, your durable results uh, and, and so on. So mm -hmm. let's move towards the uh, the, me the the me mechanistics of the mental fossa here. You want to go? So sure. I mean, we just have this uh, uh, slide on what will be the goals of your treatment, and I think it's just going through. Uh, um, what uh, uh, Yin just did, and you want to cure the patient, uh, and, and this is what mm, would be the reason for many patients to choose the uh, uh, the surgical route. Um, they, they cannot live with the idea of even though radio surgery may control their tumor, they don't want to have that thing in their head. Mm -hmm. uh, preserve hearing, which is the the main goal of the of the treatment. You want to have results that are durable uh, in the long term, and and obviously you you like. In, in any other procedure that you do in neurosurgery, you want you want to have results that are superior to the natural history, correct? So, trying to summarize with this with this man, and this is uh, you know history was history was a little bit more uh, convoluted, but he's a 46 year old man. He's got great hearing. He's got a 1.6 uh, uh, right-sided vestibular schwannoma. Uh, he's got a fundal cap. So the, the discussion goes, you know, according to what, if you look at the current evidence, obviously everybody will have their own local experience. These are tumors that grow very slowly. Um, at some point in his age, if, if you plot any statistical analysis, we have about 50% chances of having some sort of intervention. And, uh, and, and, and you know, it's unclear uh, whether hearing outcome, which surgery at least is better with early treatment. Uh, we're seeing some more uh, data from radio surgery. I'm sure that our um, surprise guests will, will talk about that. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but we'll read what they publish. And so uh, looking at the options, uh, observation, number one choice for most patients, surgery, radio surgery. When you compare, because this is, this is unavoidable. Uh, th these patients tend to, uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, shop a lot for, for opinions. And, and even though, you know, uh, they tend to be very educated. The, yeah. the uh, Acoustic Neuroma Association is a very vocal, very, very strong uh, um, advocacy group for, for patients. And, and, uh, and there's a lot of resources. When, when you compare uh, head to head, you're, and, and then you also need not forget that you're comparing the best scenario for surgery in general uh, for tumor control versus radio surgery, which is a little bit more, and, and I don't want to demean the technique, but it's a little bit more automated. There's not so much in terms of the uh, uh, little details that you may encounter in surgery. Seems a pretty well set forth uh, 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 course for, for, for radiation set therapy. They, they have their, their parameters and, and they act accordingly. Of course, you know, they, they, they have to be masters at what they do like everybody else. Uh, hearing preservation, if you look at it, Dr. Friedman's uh, uh, series, about two thirds, this has been our experience, two out of three patients get good serviceable hearing. Regular surgery has a little bit edge on that. Um, we can always comment on what's going to happen in the long term. Facial weakness, uh, yes, if you look at the literature, 5% or our numbers are much less than that. 
thank God. And radio surgery still has a 1%. I, I honestly, I have seen probably a couple of patients treated with radiation uh, that have had uh, facial weakness and, and certainly were not this size of tumor. And facial numbness also maybe a little bit more with radio surgery. So when you look at this head to head in the long term, um, they, they, they are fairly comparable. So we talked about the treatment options. We said TransLab, if you want to preserve hearing, is crossed out. Uh, you have middle fossa, which is, at least in, 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 our, in our world, uh, probably the preferred approach. Although, uh, if you look at certain masters in, in the retrosigmoid approach, I mean, I have the, 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 the blessing and then the, the, the luxury of watching Dr. Tatajiva do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, He's, he's, he's a master and his results yes. are just fantastic. And so it, it is certainly possible. There's a lot of literature coming from Italy also on, on, on retrosigmoid um, more recently, and, and you can certainly accomplish good, good, uh, good hearing preservation. But see, still the generally accepted uh, um, consensus is that middle fossa is the hearing preservation technique. And you know, you need to adjust for all the you know, tumor characteristics. So. Uh, we touched a little bit on uh, indications, tumors that are in generally less than two centimeters um, in length, uh, not in contact with the brainstem may be a good candidate for middle fossa, people with, with serviceable hearing. <clears throat> uh, age younger than 60 in general, that, that's a line that we tend not to cross. Uh, and, and obviously some of the contraindications, uh, head injury, seizures, uh, particularly in the concern is for temporal lobe retraction. So one of the things that we specifically focus is, is uh, on brain relaxation at the time of, time of surgery. It makes a big difference to have a, re a retraction injury, particularly in your dominant uh, hemisphere. The retrosigmoid, we said that generally is accepted uh, lower hearing preservation rates. Again, I put an asterisk there. And, and it's, you know, it, it's a more uh, global approach. So you can, you can treat pretty much any, any tumor size uh, uh, through the retrosigmoid approach. Uh, this are some uh, schematics from our uh, two Van Lover and Keller Atlas, uh, getting a little bit old. That is how we normally position the patient, trying to keep the, uh, um, the um, arch of the zygoma pretty much parallel to the floor, just for comfort. Patients need to have some uh, uh, bumps in the shoulder just to avoid any traction there, any injuries. Uh, their, their, their head is kind of, the vertex is kind of dropped down to expose the middle fossa. Uh, that, that, that's your starting point, but having good beds nowadays overcomes a lot of these issues. Uh, I talked about brain, brain relaxation. We tend to put lumbar drains and then remove them at the time of surgery. Uh, we're very aggressive with brain relaxation. We work a lot with anesthesia and their management of, of, of the brain. Um, on occasions, we have done high volume spinal taps, but we tend to, move, to do more lumbar drains. Um, and we're very heavy in uh, neurophysiologic monitoring. Ravi, you're the king of monitoring. <laughs> so, yeah, I think a big part here is we all know about training our seven uh, motor evoked potentials, SSEPs. I am a huge fan of the cochlear nerve action potential monitoring. The challenge is right now, actually, one of Rick's uh, colleagues and a good friend of ours, uh, Bob Cueva, had a great electro that we were using for a long time and that's no longer on the market. So we try different things to try to get an electro that works as well. It's more challenging, but it's a near field response, not a far field response. You get information from the standpoint of tumor dissection and risk of hearing loss within a few seconds afterwards, rather than, rather than waiting for about 30 uh, seconds or so with an AVR. So Robbie, what is your method of finding the IAC? Yeah, so um, you know we've got the video coming up in a little bit. So I don't think there's one method alone. Um, you know, has Bill House, uh, who Rick trained with, will tell you or how he did it initially. When you're first learning middle fossa uh, anatomy and trying to follow a GSP and labyrinth segment, is where angels fear to tread. Right, like that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, for me, uh, the way uh, Bruce Gans learned from Ugo Fish was to blue line the Superior Canal, and I really like that because. That blue line, the superior canal, is uh, perpendicular to the superior petrosal sinus. And one of the things you're commenting in, and you've probably seen this with Rick and Mark already, is the uh, mastoid pneumatization pattern is very variable. And so there are times when the highest point of the middle fossil floor is actually not the superior canal. So I actually like to blue line it. And then once I do that, I really can work immediately very aggressively. And Walter, uh, to get to tumors larger than those just filling the IAC, 
uh, they pooch out into the CPA just a little bit, you've got to get more extension closer to the IEC in between the Superior Canal and the IEC. So it allows me to drill more safely that way. Got another uh, nice view of the middle fossil floor. Um, you know, using all the things in your armamentarium from following where the EAC is to the IEC. I think one of the things that's important, and I uh, don't use the retractors that I have here. I'll use either the, the fish middle fossil floor retractor or the house urban retractor. Um, having the ability to really get uh, the Dura elevated all the way to the pores is incredibly important. These types of retractors are fine if you're just doing uh, a Bell's palsy type facial nerve decompression. But you really have to get to the pores uh, to see uh, and get exposure. We truly try to limit the amount of retraction that we give. Uh, so we, we use them as uh, spare, as, you know, as little as possible. And here's some schematics on, on how, uh, how the dissection goes into uh, usually the way, and you will see in the videos, usually Ravi identifies the uh, facial nerve distally into the IAC. It's easier to find it uh, there in the uh, cisternal segment. That's this usually doesn't, usually you know, never touches the brainstem. And so uh, um, trying to open the capsule, they'll lay, lay some additions. And then ultimately, once the tumor is isolated, you section the, uh, uh, the vestibular nerve once it's separated. So here's a video that Walter, you may have to just speed up a little. Yeah, so if you can see on the right of the drill, you're gonna see a little hint of that blue lining. That's incredibly important. Um, and it's interesting, one of the key steps with this is you go back to basics. Like even when I look at uh, this video, I'm bothered by the amount of blood along the temporal lobe dura. Uh, we train fellows like Rick does, and those are the little steps that are so important. Now, this is the sauna pet that I'm using here. I really like that. I think I've gotten to be better with exposing the fundus than early in my career. On the sauna pet, there are times when you're drilling in this area and it's fatiguing. So the sauna pet allows you to kind of rest your hand. You're using something that is not going to have a spooling effect. Everyone's fear when they're doing the middle fossa, especially for inexperienced surgeons, is remember the facial nerve could be sitting right underneath your dura in the IAC. And if you drill aggressively along the middle fossa floor, you risk tearing that dura and tearing seven underneath. Uh, if you remember on the axial MRI image, uh, one of the things is that this tumor pooched a little more anteriorly into the IAC than we think of with a lot of acoustics. And Rick and Norberto both know well from all the work here at UC over the years with our Peter Clive meningioma work, getting more anterior extent into quasis. I've done that more aggressively than in years past. Um, just using a crab tree there to open up the door. Very challenging with smaller tumors because you have to be very careful. There's not a loop of ICA coming into the IAC. And so uh, opening up very slowly and carefully. Uh, I'm not sure if this video shows it, but I now am much more, this is an older video of ours. I tend to remove the retractor blade uh, more than I ever used to, because I think as Norberto said, minimizing retraction is good for the temporal lobe. But then also the housing and assembly is really hard to work with. It's in front of your hands. Um, and it can be, you have to get your hands around it. That craniotomy has to be centered on the zygomatic root. Otherwise you're not gonna have uh, comfort with getting to the intra-auditory canal. You can see right underneath uh, my Brackman suction irrigator and the uh, uh, right angle pick, you're starting to see seven. You can see the color, uh, that nice white color, uh, as opposed to superior vestibular nerve, which is a little bit grayer, uh, a little bit duller right below it. As soon as you elevate that dura, you have to start looking for seven right away. I actually like to decompress labyrinthine segment, especially for tumors that extend to the fundus, because once I find nerve at the labyrinthine segment, it allows me then to say, okay, I know where seven is. Uh, Mario has done this so well. This is him operating here. And uh, he loves using the Pras probe. He and Norberto taught me a lot of uh, techniques and how to dissect tumor with the Pras because you're using it as an instrument while you're stimulating for the facial nerve as well. Norberto, your thoughts also? No, same story. Yes, we, you know, we, we tend to use the Pras probe a lot, and uh, it, and uh, and again, same comment. And some, you know, we always make the uh, the, the same comment that why is this so bloody and you know, for, for some reason, the, the video tends to show that, but we, we, we use no coagulation. So we have, uh, we have forbidden residents to use any kind of bipolar once the IAC is open uh, out of concern for, um, for compromising circulation to um, either uh, seven or eight. And uh, 
And really, once you have identified the, the proximal and the distal ends of, of, of seven, uh, your, your game is just try to lice the additions the best way you can, try not to put any traction, uh, avoid any sort of torsion on, on, on the uh, packet. And then every once in a while, we use just some sharp dissection when we, uh, um, when we encounter very, very thick additions. But um, mostly with the press probe, I would say we, we do probably 80% of the resection of the tumor. And then as I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. Yeah, go ahead because this is going to get boring. <laughs> I think what's also important is having the pattern available. So if we start seeing changes in uh, the auditory vote potentials, stopping dissection is important because we're really trying to save hearing, of course, right? And uh, just stopping a little bit more irrigating well using some papaverin uh, that's diluted. Uh, one of the things um, that we've learned a lot, and I think uh, Rick, you and, and Mark, and uh, I think Eric Wilkinson probably published this. Uh, I'm frustrated by, especially early in my career, I did not do as good a job in the fundus as I would have liked. And I like having the endoscope at the end now. And I think uh, using that to look into the fundus to make sure there's not any tumor underneath seven um, and uh, you don't want to leave tumor behind, of course. Yeah, it's truly, that's where most of, but all of your recurrences will, will yeah, come from. Yeah, essentially, you have direct control of the, uh, and you can see there through the endoscope or the picture in picture there. Uh, but that's where your recurrences will come. So we, we take special concern about that. So here's just a quick summary of your corridors and your surgical setup. Nothing to your, and please go ahead. So one of the things to remember is unfortunately there can be a risk of recurrence uh, early in your career, especially in. You've got to watch your results very, very closely, and it's uh, we all still do that to this day. Uh, I've used both fat and muscle to plug the IEC defect, but I've noticed here, and you can see on the axial cuts, I've noticed enhancement with the muscle, whereas I don't with the fat. And so that linear enhancement, uh, especially because it's posterior in the IEC, is muscle related. But that being said, I still will get repeat scans down the road to make sure that uh, there's no chance of recurrence. Here's a fiesta image. There that you see, and these are the post-operative audiograms uh, in relation to the pre-operative yeah. audiogram. So, yeah. still, still. So we're sensitive. absolutely happy with that, but we'd always like to do better, right? Our goal is to get better as surgeons uh, each and every case we do. So this somehow summarizes what the decision process has been for this case. It's certainly a valid alternative if you want to preserve hearing. Uh, indications are limited uh, by the size of the tumor. Usually, the patient's health. Um, good. Results are tend to be comparable with uh, with stereotactic radio surgery, and the, the argument is that you always take the most of the risk up front uh, at, at the very beginning, mm -hmm. and and with the hope that in the long term you're going to have uh, uh, very good hearing uh, in the long term uh, in terms of durability as compared. So, to so thank you guys uh, for that presentation. That uh, that was wonderful, especially the video was really really uh, detailed and and telling. Uh, just a little plug now, if you haven't heard enough about middle fossa approach, I'm actually giving a webinar on how augmented reality can help us with this approach in a couple of days. Uh, and so if anybody wants to join in that time. Um, I, I am uh, nothing but a TV producer here with the Surgeon's Log 2020. And as, as a producer, there's nothing more boring than an episode of TV where everybody agrees with each other. So, um, you know, I, I knew that both teams are going to be very uh, pro-surgery. And I, I decided that I've got to have someone that uh, makes you all a little bit uncomfortable. So um, Dr. Konzioka is here to tell us what we all did wrong here. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, Doug, if you can show yourself and uh, unmute your mic. Um, I'd like to know uh, where, what, what your thoughts are about the case, but also what your general thoughts about small tumors are. Uh, are, are small tumors, uh, are small tumors uh, legitimate to, to radiate? Are these small tumors legitimate to operate? Uh, or, or should we wait, uh, and, and so on. So please take over the podium, your thoughts, Doug. Thank you for joining us, first of all. Thanks, Walter. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. The discussion was excellent. The videos were uh, great, and uh, obviously a, a very high-level discussion, particularly as it relates to management and, uh, and the anatomy. It's always wonderful to, to see that. Uh, just a few comments. Um, obviously, a patient who's a young patient, uh, and that came up uh, in terms of the durability of the different options for a 45-year-old. Uh, hearing preservation being another concern, obviously, in this case. 
And uh, the wonderful thing now is that this patient has options. In terms of the observation options, based upon our own volumetric natural history data, um, I think that a 45-year-old is likely going to have to have this treated at some point in his life. So, you know, the slide that says, you know, 50%, you know, will have an intervention kind of means 50% will not have an intervention. I just don't think that's likely to happen here. I mean, is this person really going to go for the next 45 years without, without getting anything done? Uh, he could certainly observe, and it may be years before he does. Uh, it could be three years, five years, 10, but I think that 50% number is probably erroneous for this person. Um, I think the, the metal fossa and retrosigmoid hearing preservation approaches are something that uh, everybody at this age needs to know about, and especially in the hands of, of people who are very experienced in it. And as, you, as we all know, some of these people get on the radio surgery bandwagon right away. You know, they say, well, I don't want surgery. Um, you know, they may be just referred in, but they need to know that in, in, in with specific experience that uh, hearing preservation from one of these approaches could be a durable uh, outcome for that person. And uh, they may choose surgery because of that. Uh, the radio surgery outcomes, I think were mentioned earlier um, that, you know, there's some data showing decline after five, 10 years or so. And that seems to be the case in the, in the literature. There's not a lot of, but you have to just realize there's not a lot of data at 10 years with modern radio surgery dose planning. And when I say modern, I mean caring about the cochlea, uh, which really started about 2009, uh, and then papers started coming out. So the longer term data isn't really about that, um, but it's coming. Um, you know, complete facial palsy for um, this operation, for, for a resection at 1%, my take is really? That seems uh, that seems wonderful. That means you get you get you get one. You got to do the next ninety nine, and and everything's got to go uh, you know very very well. But of course, in the hands of specific technical masters, I think it is low. Uh, but that's probably not a national figure. And yeah. you know, patients no, need to, you're right. You know, patients need to know who uh, who they're dealing with. Um, so you know, I think that. I don't think this patient's too young for radio surgery. I think we actually have a lot of long-term data after radio surgery. Some people have kind of made the argument that because for the last 25 years, we've been challenged to follow these patients because we didn't know what the outcomes were. There's a lot of long-term data. In fact, it, it may be actually more than the resection series in terms of imaging, since a lot of the time, you know, the patient got a scan a few years later and it looked pretty clean. And then it's, well, don't, you know, don't, you don't need another scan at 10 years unless you have a problem. So I think there's, there's very good long-term data. I'm not concerned about cancer risk in a 45-year-old. Uh, I've never seen it in 30 years, and it's probably equal to the general population risk. If you haven't seen a recent article on that topic, we published one in Lancet Oncology on 5,000 patients with benign disease, and that, uh, and, and that risk is really low. And then I think the other thing, just as a final comment, um, we're, we're pretty excited about cochlear implant technology in irradiated tumors. And um, of course, this person has good hearing in the other ear, but it, but it should it ever be down or, uh, or will be a problem later on, um, you know, a cochlear implant, you know, could be a consideration um, in such a patient. So it's a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And um, so I have a couple questions for you, Doug. Uh, what, what would yeah. you quote this patient for, in, for a possibility for retreatment? That is to say, a regrowth after radio surgery and the need for retreatment. How likely or unlikely for someone like him? Yeah, I, I would tell him that, uh, you know, long-term tumor control, that means we don't need to do anything else to your tumor. In, in my practice, about 97%. 97%. So, yeah. and the, the other question would be for, for this particular patient, would you wait to see the tumor grow a little bit to then radiate or would you just radiate off, or is it a patient's choice? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a hot topic of discussion. There's uh, some work coming up from the University of Pittsburgh um, making, the, making the argument that earlier intervention is better if you've got grade A high level hearing. Once you, once you start to drop down the slope, you're probably, keep, you're, you're probably on, a, on a trajectory for loss. So that's the tough, that's the tough situation right now. We, we've just finished, we, we've taken our natural history data and this is not yet published, um, but it was submitted this week. Well, we looked at the hearing outcomes in the observed patients. 
And those that were growing uh, faster, that, that meant 80% by volume per year, had a much more rapid hearing decline outside the serviceable range. And that was at two years. If they were a slow growth pattern, um, it, it took six years. So now we're gonna compare that to the radiosurgery outcomes to the natural history hearing outcomes. Of course, there's never been a randomized trial and there likely is never to be one. Uh, but we do have a, a lot of observed patients here um, and we're, we're trying to use that data as, be as best we can. Thank you for those comments, Doug. And, and again, thank you for joining us. Rick, your turn. What do you think? I think Doug is such a smart and nice man, but, but, <laughs> I, dis but I disagree with a lot. Uh, he knows that. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to give a little presentation and Please cover some screen. of the areas that I agree and disagree. Um, so let's see, I have to share my screen, I guess, right? Uh, please do. Um, all right. I'll try to make this somewhat <coughs> quick. There, should, yeah, there you go. There it is. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and obviously there are a couple of people that I have to thank um, before I give such a talk. Um, my mentors, Daryl Brackman and Bill Hitzelberger. Uh, for the trainees out there, I, I, I cannot tell you how important it is um, to be very well trained in this approach. It is a delicate approach. I, by listening to people talk about it, I think I can tell who knows how to do it and who doesn't. And Ravi made some points that are so critical and clearly show that he is well-trained. Bruce is fantastic and understands this. Uh, same with uh, Norberto. Um, you guys understand it. Um, and then uh, of course, Mark Schwartz. I think Mark is, uh, I do, I do really fine with little tumors in the IEC. When we stretch the indications a bit with acoustics, uh, I think Mark is just fabulous at yeah. taking out slightly larger tumors through the middle fossa. Um, I'll skip that. So these are the sorts of tumors we're talking about um, in uh, for middle fossa, and those are uh, fundal tumors. Now, I think Rob Jackler said it once, Ravi alluded to it today. Uh, you can't take away the transverse crest. So when tumors are impacted into the fundus, uh, some of the dissection is still blind, not as blind as it might be in a retrosig. Although if Cueva was on the phone right now, he if we're on the line right now, he would, uh, he would balk at that. But these are the typical tumors. These are the typical audiograms, uh, not always. Um, so, as a neurotologist, as somebody who, you know, the motto at the house clinic where I trained and spent 15 years of my career was, so all may hear. Um, and I, I really believe that it's incumbent upon us as neurotologists, especially those of us that treat a lot of these tumors, to really consider hearing. Um, these are some of the issues patients have with single-sided deafness. And it, if you look at the ANA and if you look at the surveys, <clears throat> certainly facial nerve issues and, and vestibular issues are the primary ones that patients complain about. But there's a, there, there are deficits associated with single-sided deafness that I think we need to address. Um, natural history of, of hearing with acoustic neuroma, um, as Doug alluded to, and probably accounts for um, the better hearing results after radio surgery for patients with good word recognition is uh, that with good word recognition, typically hearing can last for quite a while. Um, that doesn't control for tumor growth, which is the other consideration. But when they present with hearing loss, uh, often it's progressive and you can tell them that they're not likely to have serviceable hearing for much longer. Uh, as Doug was mentioning, tumor growth uh, is definitely associated with poor long-term hearing. Um, let's look at hearing preservation. These are uh, busy tables and not a lot of long-term follow-up if you look in the follow-up year column. Um, 
but this was a really nice article. You know, uh, Matt Carlson publishes way too much and needs to spend time <laughs> uh, golfing, but, <laughs> but he's doing a great job. And, you know, Mike Link, who was at Cincinnati as a fellow when I was there as faculty, and Mike has grown into, uh, I'm really proud of Mike. He is really a spectacular person in this field. Yes. I really trust his data. And if you look at the data, um, they found that durable hearing preservation a decade after low dose uh, stereotactic radio surgery for vestibular schwannoma occurs in less than one fourth of their patients. So Doug, I disagree. I think that the natural history of vestibular schwannoma, even with good word recognition in the beginning, is for a decline over time. And I think the data shows uniformly that if you leave the tumor in, i.e. observation or radio surgery, there are effects of the tumor presence. Namely, one thing my fellow didn't mention, and I'm not disappointed, but it's time for another spanking, I guess, um, <laughs> is the T2 flare, the T2 flare. So you look at the T2 flare, and if you see brightness in the cochlea, that patient's hearing is threatened, and it's threatened by the tumor, by the tumor presence, whether you radiate it or observe it, it's threatened. So that is another part of the image that I counsel patients on. For us, um, I totally agree with the approach in this case. Um, I think Mark, Mark is uh, much more conservative than I am, although in the end, we obviously don't go anywhere without agreeing. Mm -hmm. But what I really like about Mark's counseling, which I <laughs> now used for every single patient. So obviously our practice is a little skewed, right? If you looked at the way we manage tumors in San Diego, Orange County, and now we're getting them from Los Angeles, these are people that are local. Um, they came to us because they heard about us, of course, but they're local, so we're easy to get to. And I would say we manage them the way everybody across the country does. We observe a lot of them, we operate on some of them, and we radiate some of them. Um, but our practice is pre-selected by people who know of our reputation, who visit that wonderful Facebook page <laughs> um, that my patients started when I left USC, because USC basically wrote all of my patients a letter saying, that I was going to San Diego, probably open a surf shop. And yes, I will eventually, but not yet. <laughs> um, but what Mark says to the patient is, if you're motivated for long-term hearing preservation, then microsurgery is the best way to accomplish that, but it's also the quickest way to lose it. And right. that's the way I counsel patients who come to us and say, look, I've done my homework. I know what I want. I want a metal fossa. And I will say, okay, I'm, you know, provided everything is in order. I will provide you with that approach, but I need you to look me in the eyes and understand, because the relationship is important, that uh, there is a 35, 40, sometimes as low as 20, if you have a superior nerve tumor that is with fundal fluid and it's small, that could be 80 or 85% hearing preservation, but you have to be prepared and not disappointed for hearing loss. And yes, in great hands, the facial nerve paralysis rate is under 1%. We are gonna, we're looking at our middle fossa data. I'm not saying we don't have patients who, during the course of their care, lose some facial function, but the overall uh, House Brackman grade one or two is 90, about 96%. Um, the grade six so far uh, long-term is, is zero. Um, this is just a paper that Nathan Tu, who was my resident and now is finishing his fellowship at the Michigan Ear Institute did. Um, when I was at USC, Steve Giannata really preferred to do middle fossa for tumors only that were within the IEC that did not protrude out of the meatus. That is not my current practice, but, but Steve, there were some really good reasons for that. And that's because the hearing preservation rates are better when they're tiny. Um, so for fundal fluid, we definitely saw a trend again towards better hearing preservation with fundal fluid. So Walter, you're absolutely right. That has to be something in the consideration. Involvement of the cochlear aperture, the base of the cochlea. Um, 
there was a, uh, again, a trend towards poor hearing uh, preservation when the aperture was involved. Um, so let's talk about the indications up to a centimeter in the CP angle, which is about uh, two centimeters. The largest tumor I have ever successfully dealt with through middle fossa was with Bill Hitzelberger, who had no fear. We did a 2.4 <laughs> centimeter tumor, uh, 2.4 centimeters, and a guy from England, I'll never forget, he was in the music industry, and I was young, it was 1997, and uh, I was hot to trot. This guy said, I only want middle fossa. I only want my hearing preserved. And so I was this young, naive kid and said, oh, we can do it. And I'll never forget, Hitzelberger walked in the room, looked at him and he said, you know, you could die from this. And the guy looked at him back and he said, if I lose my hearing, I would rather die anyway. <laughs> Bill saved his hearing. It's, uh, that is not common, not common. <laughs> Um, the advantages, complete IEC exposure of the middle fossa, except for the transverse crest. And in contrast to what some of our colleagues say across the country, that it's dangerous for the facial nerve, with high resolution uh, KISS MRI, Mark has taught me, uh, you can really see where the facial nerve is going. And if the facial nerve is going on top of the tumor, we will absolutely tell the patient, Middle fossa is not a good idea, um, but that's, that's the exception, not the rule. So early facial nerve identification, which Bill House's dictum always was, if you don't wanna hurt the facial nerve, then identify it. Yep. These are tough. This is a temporal bone cross section with the cochlea um, showing tumors way up against the uh, cochlear base. I think that um, and I've talked to my neuroradiologist about this, and so far there is no good answer. But here's my feeling about fundal fluid and hearing preservation. There are typically two types of tumors, in my opinion. There are soft tumors that break apart, and you have to take them out piecemeal. And there are very firm tumors that once you engage them, you can feel they're not going to break, and they often roll right out. So my feeling is if they roll out, I don't care how impacted they are into the fundus, your likelihood of saving hearing is very, very good. If they break apart and you're having to continually swipe into the fundus to get that last little bit out, I think every swipe you are taking a risk with the cochlear nerve or the vascularity and yeah. those patients don't do as well. But there's no way to determine that pre-op as far as I can tell. If somebody knows that there is, please tell me, uh, but I don't believe there is. So you asked about uh, how do we find the IAC? So Yin is right. We, um, we use the arcuate and we define the superior semicircular canal, but there is this little protrusion which is not well demonstrated by the author, unfortunately, of our textbook uh, of uh, lateral skull base uh, atlas. There is always I say always in medicine uh, because the anatomy of the temporal bone is often, it, it's just so constant between individuals. Mm. There is always a little, as you're putting the retractor in, as Ravi said, into the groove of the superior petrosal sinus, there is always a little peninsula that comes out as you're elevating from posterior to anteromedial. That peninsula is always over the porous acousticus, always. So the house urban retractor is cup shaped and I try my best to put that cup in that peninsula. And then I know where my IAC is. Now, as far as blue lining goes, Ravi is absolutely right. If you know where your canal is, you can be more aggressive laterally. And I'm gonna share some little tidbits of anatomy that Daryl taught me that have served me well, but I will say one um, warning. Um, I just saw a patient who had a middle fossa done by uh, one of my former trainees. I looked at the CT. The guy did a beautiful job, saved the patient's hearing, blue lined her canal, and she is miserable from autophony. Um, Mark and I, I'll, uh, I'll be, full disclosure, the moral to the story is never operate on a uh, very wealthy young lawyer who has a uh, trust fund. 
<laughs> so we did a middle fossa on him. I blue lined his canal. We saved his hearing perfectly. He had great hearing. He tried to sue us for autophony from canal dehiscence. Wow. So, um, you know, you just have to be careful. And I guess it's something else you have to discuss with the patient that there is this possibility. So I, it, I, it sort of depends on the day. I don't have a systematic approach. What I like to do, and I think you can do very well, is define the otic capsule bone of the superior canal without necessarily blue lining it. it. And so I've tended to do that a little bit more now than I used to because uh, I don't, don't want to get sued. <laughs> anyway, our um, wonderful illustrator also blew it by not showing the retractor where we put it, and that is in the true Petrus Ridge. If you put it on the on the what Ugo Fish called the meatal plane, you're going to miss the porous, and it's not helpful. So don't buy our book. Uh, <laughs> here is some rotten anatomy, and I just wanted to share some tidbits that Daryl taught me. First of all, this is the bifurcation of the angle we were discussing. Obviously, for you trainees, uh, middle fossa would be a great procedure if we could open the cochlea and open the superior canals and know exactly where we were, but that would lead to deafness. But for the purposes of illustration, uh, the one problem with this figure is that uh, all of this bone, as Robbie demonstrated beautifully in his video, really nicely, he went right up to the edge of the canal because for our neurosurgical colleagues, this is the window for them to roll the tumor out of. Yeah, if right. you ever try to roll a tumor anteriorly, you're gonna get a facial. You get a facial. So we've got to provide and that's why blue lining or defining the canal is important. We have got to provide a big postmeatal space for our neurosurgical colleagues. Yep. Okay, so for everybody here, including you seasoned veterans, um, Simon Parisier, who was a neurotologist in New York, retired, um, wrote a beautiful paper in the annals. It, then back then it was called the Annals of Otology, Rhinology, and Laryngology. Uh, defining the morphometrics of the, the temporal bone with regard to the middle fossa. So a couple of things. The distance between the anterior surface of the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve and the basal turn of the cochlea is seven-tenths of a millimeter. So for all you neurosurgeons who think you're so hot that you clip aneurysms, we get tension too, you know. <laughs> I used to have a full afro and now I'm bald because of that. <laughs> So that's number one. Number two, what Simon pointed out was the distance, the average distance between the ampulated end of the superior canal and the basal turn of the cochlea is about 2.6 millimeters. So I never use more than a 2.5 millimeter diamond burr out laterally. And to date, I've never gotten into an ampulla and I've never gotten into a cochlea. So those are a couple of rules of thumb. And lastly, what Daryl taught me, which is really, really outstanding, is as Ravi says, it is pretty important, unless your tumor has a big fundal cap and you don't have to risk going laterally and you can clearly see in the dura where your tumor lies and then you're out beyond it laterally and you can see the blue of the empty IAC, for the most part, you should define the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. And another little tidbit that um, is important you have to smooth off this edge. I'm pointing at my computer like you guys can see. You have to smooth off this edge of the bone of the cochlea. If you leave a, um, a sharp edge here, especially if you're working with a new neurosurgeon, which a lot, some of you trainees might be doing middle fossa for the first time with somebody, yeah. when they go to deliver the tumor from medial to lateral, they can tug on the facial nerve and that sharp edge can cut it. So you have to be very careful. But the point I wanna make is, to avoid getting into the ampulla of the superior canal, where, where you will lose hearing if you do, you cannot go beyond the mid portion of the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve on the superior vestibular nerve. So you can't take the superior vestibular nerve dissection all the way out to the same level you do the facial or you'll get into the vestibule or the ampulla. So define your labyrinthine segment and then take your fundal dissection of your superior vestibular nerve only halfway out that distance and you will remain safe. Um, hearing preservation can be outstanding in middle fossa. It, it is long-term, so we remove 
the the tumor, mm -hmm. we remove the the whatever is causing the proteinaceous buildup inside the cochlea that is ototoxic. Uh, and hearing preservation is good long term. So microsurgery, we think, is a treatment of choice for those patients who are suitable and desire long-term hearing preservation. That's my backyard. Uh, and I do have a case I'd like to present to the panel. Is that all right, Walter? Oh, please do. OK, we're at 814. OK. Oh, the other thing we didn't take into consideration, and I'd love to hear Doug's uh, opinion on this, is the patient that comes in and says, well, one of two things. Either we see rapid growth, like a doubling of a tumor, so way more than two millimeters in a year, or their primary complaint is disequilibrium, dizziness. In our opinion, disequilibrium is a contraindication to radiosurgery. Um, we think that a complete vestibular ablation is a treatment of choice. So this is a 70-year-old, no, 68-year-old woman with left-sided trigeminal neuralgia and disequilibrium, no hearing loss. She's, she walks like eight miles a day. She's crazy as a loon, uh, but she wants help. She can't stand the pain and she can't stand the dizziness. What would the panel do? Well, what does a trigeminal nerve look like? Well, I only took a screenshot, but this thing, <laughs> this thing is pushing on the trigeminal. All right, so it goes up much, much higher than that, obviously. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm such a neurotologist. I only care about seven and eight. <laughs> <laughs> no, Berto? No, but in the same line, I was just pointing to Ravi also to the screen like everybody can see me. So I'm just as crazy as you, Rick. I mean, you, you can always argue that she can come through the middle fossa and drill into the petro, what we like to call yeah. the petroclial angle. So you do an anterior yeah. petrosectomy. I mean, we, 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 we have used that approach quite a bit to, to treat um, brainstem carinomas. Um, so you can get actually infratrigeminal all the way with that bone. And you could decompress the nerve if you have a big trigeminal component. Yeah, I think in an expanded middle fossa approach, and that's um, how we both call anterior it. and posterior, Rick, to me, would be a great option. And then, and then, but this looks like more than anything else, right? So I yeah. think the patient. So I, I, I will play the devil's advocate here yeah. then. Uh, a retro sig uh, with supramedial drilling to get towards the face to, to get towards the fifth nerve, uh, I think would be uh, safe, uh, effective, uh, uh, given uh, assuming uh, the scans that we cannot see, uh, hypothetical scans that are invisible here. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that would be the uh, alternative. So, yeah, you, you, you can certainly do that. that that's the Tatajiva, the Pipa, Rista, how he calls him, it's a reverse Kawasi approach. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I still think that you have better control of the, of the trigeminal nerve along the path of the nerve if you come from middle fossa. Uh, coming from behind, it's just hard to see in the bottom. It's getting very dark and you start passing all these instruments in, in, in between the cranial nerves. Um, I, I don't know, maybe because I got more comfortable. Yeah, this is a lot. I got more comfortable with but Ravi doing all with. this middle fossa that at that I would favor trying to do that. But it, what you said is, is perfectly fine. I mean, I don't like them. I mean, that cerebellum sort of looks just too plump too. So Rick, what's the right answer? Well, I it's not, it's not fair that I didn't show you the coronals. So um, I this was a great case. Her meningioma was uh, tentorially based, did not go below the IAC. Um, so we did an extended middle fossa, uh, removed you know the whole thing as much as you can with a meningioma. Um, mm. What I like about it, uh, Walter, over the retrosig is is the reach issue with the retrosig, but also we're really able to drill away the bony component. So yeah. hopefully mm. recurrence will be less because I can drill out Kawasi's triangle, I can drill out the postmeatal triangle. Um, and so we, and, and so as soon as I did, I opened up the dura of the IC and the tumor, I just, I, I gently pulled the tumor out of the fundus and you could see seven and eight going down. They were not attached. So she came out of it great. She, I hate to say this because this always happens at meetings. You know, I have to flex my muscle and say she went hiking two weeks later. 
not typical, but these patients do a lot better than vestibular schwannoma patients because they're not dizzy. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, to, just to be clear though, the reverse uh, middle fossa, which is the supermedial drilling, would also take away the bone uh, equivalent to the Kawase uh, area, but yes. from posterior fossa inside out. You, you, yes, and there's, there's, there's studies comparing that, and you could, you could accomplish the same in terms of uh, volumetric bone resection, if you will. Uh, still, I think that you end up in a much more uncomfortable, uh, and, I've, and I've done it for a trigeminal trauma. I remember doing that with Miles, remember? That, yeah. I had to talk him into that. I think the uh, issue for that reach, um, and Rick, probably you agree with this, I think one of the things I don't like about the retrosig for a neurotologist, you're using a high-speed drill intradurally, not extradurally. Right. This would be the drill. This would be the drill that you're that we're more used to using with the endonasal approach, with a, with a curved drill with a long shaft. Yeah. Uh, and I think the uh, sauna pet's helpful because I yeah. think when I work in that area, exactly, I'm more protected around the neurovasculature. Uh, the other point I was going to make, uh, I'm blanking, so that must not be important. Uh, the drill, we talked about the drill, we talked about the reach, uh, oh, well, blanking. Anyway, so, um, so you did a, a, a metal fossa extent. Metal okay, fossa, yeah. excellent. Um, we, we're over our, our usual time here. Uh, I, I want to, at this point, thank our panelists. I think that was an amazing discussion. Uh, and, and Dr. Ren, you are the first non-neurosurgical trainee to be on the hot seat. So congratulations on, on having Thanks. that honor, even though apparently <laughs> you're going to get, you're gonna get some punishment from your boss, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, hey, look at the flare. Look at the flare. Look, look at the flare. Look at the flare. <laughs> he, will uh, never, he will never forget that lesson. Never. <laughs> uh, uh, so thank you everybody for your thank time you. today for a thank very, you. very high level discussion. I always end these with a plug for the next uh, session so everybody knows. The afford, twice aforementioned uh, uh, Marco Tatagiba will be in fact the honored guest for next time, oh, which wonderful. is very wow. kind of funny. Uh, uh, he is not talking about the lateral skull base, however. Uh, it is truly going to be an international session. We have a hot seater from France who is actually Italian. Uh, we have a presenting surgeon who's from Japan, and we, of course, have the aforementioned, three times mentioned, Tata Giba as our honored uh, uh, guest. So join us in two weeks uh, for that uh, session. And with that, I bid you adieu. Thank you, everybody, panelists, and thank you for all the attendees. Thank you.